Hello and welcome to the video. Thank you very much indeed for joining it. I have some fascinating material to share with you today, so please stick with it. You're looking here at Wilton House, which is near Salisbury in Wiltshire, the seat of the Earls of Pembroke, the Herbert family. As many will know, it has associations with Shakespeare. If you go as a visitor, you're told by the guides that Shakespeare pitched up here for a performance of As You Like It. I don't think that's any more than myth, but there are other connections of great interest. If you go into the grandest of all the grand rooms in this house, known as the Double Cubed Room, you see this magnificent, vast painting by Anthony van Dyck. Some of you will be aware of a presentation I put online called Sir Anthony van Dyck and Sir John Suckling New. They, of course, knew who lay behind the real identity of the pseudonym William Shakespeare. Do have a look at that if you haven't seen it. Here we see the Earl of Pembroke at the time, Philip, and he is well known as being one of the dedicatees of Shakespeare's great folio of 1623. Next to him, his wife, uh, Lady Susan, uh, Countess of Montgomery. Interesting thing, they're both wearing black, and that is because she's a ghost. She's dead. Anthony van Dyke was asked to paint this picture after she had died. Philip, Earl of Pembroke, had remarried a Harridan, uh, who ran away anyway from the house, and so he chose to have his deceased wife painted with the family who were indeed her children, not the second wife's children anyway. These two were known as the most noble and twin-like pair, at least they were known as that, in a dedication to a work called Archeo Plutos, published in 1619. It's very interesting, this dedication. The most noble and twin-like pair are the truly honourable and complete perfection Sir Philip Herbert. He was Earl of Montgomery then, not yet Earl of Pembroke, and his truly, truly in Latin is via, virtuous and noble countess, his wife, Lady Susan, daughter to the right honourable Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxenford, etc, etc, etc. You can see how much space is taken up praising the deceased right honourable Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxenford, and how that uh, triangular text seems to point down to the great double V, which was one of his monikers showing how he aligned his name to the Trinity. I've talked about that on other presentations. This dedication has a remarkable resemblance to the more famous dedication four years later of the great Shakespeare folio, not dedicated this time to the most noble and twin-like pair, but to the most noble and incomparable pair. Once again, it is Philip Earl of Montgomery, but not this time his virtuous wife, uh, but his brother, William Earl of Pembroke. Interesting to see how Right Honourable is written just above the same uh, double V that on the earlier dedication is given in that vast form written right underneath the Right Honourable Edward Vere. So one has to assume that Ben Jonson, who probably was the person who set up the first folio, was deliberately making an allusion to the earlier dedication in order to point out the connection of Shakespeare with Edward de Vere. At least that's how I would interpret it, and I've never seen any Stratfordians bothering to interpret it at all. Now, in this tragic picture, we see the red the man dressed in red, that's the oldest son of Lord Pembroke. He should have been the next Lord Pembroke, but he died in the life of his father. You see him looking wistfully over at his mother as his father points to his fiancée, as if to say, you know, you've time to stop mourning, time to look to the future. Anyway, the future was not long for him. He died early, and the next Earl of Pembroke was the second brother uh, called Philip, once again holding his heart and looking across to his mother as if uh, mourning her decease. Now, Philip married in his first marriage uh, someone called Penelope Naunton, who was called after her great aunt, who was Lady Penelope Rich. And those of you who have followed the presentations that I've been putting online will know that I've put many out concerning the great scandal of Shakespeare's sonnets, which involved Lady Penelope Rich, who was the dark lady in the sonnets, and Edward de Vere, who is the poet of the sonnets. So the grandfather of one and the great aunt of the other. I bring this up because she, Penelope Naunton, was the daughter of an extremely pompous ass who was called Sir Robert Naunton 
a member of parliament, master of the wards and a secretary of state. And he tried very deliberately to airbrush the Earl of Oxford out of history when he wrote a book all about Queen Elizabeth's favourites, the servants of Queen Elizabeth's state and favour, as he called it, published after he died. Uh, but in it, he gives short lives of 47 of Queen Elizabeth's favourites. Well, we all know that for one time at least, Edward de Vere was very much her favourite, yet he leaves him out entirely. At the end he says, Modesty in me forbids defacements of men departed, whose posterity yet remaining enjoys the merit of their virtues. Well, I can only think that he's talking about Edward de Vere, and the reason for his pomposity is his awareness of the great scandal involving Penelope Rich and Edward de Vere, which, of course, spills out in the Shakespeare sonnets, and therefore, by admitting that Edward de Vere was Shakespeare, we all end in trouble. And people often ask me, well, why is it that after his death we weren't allowed to say that he was Shakespeare? You only have to look at this very powerful couple, uh, Philip, fifth Earl of Pembroke, and his wife, Penelope Norton, the grandson of one of the scandal members and the great-niece of the other, to know why it was kept very much hushed. Okay, Philip, 5th Earl of Pembroke, was the father of this man, who was Thomas, 8th Earl of Pembroke, a soldier, uh, very much a Freemason, and his son was called the 9th Earl of Pembroke, who I want to focus on a little bit. He too was a Freemason, and he was known as the Architect Earl, as he liked designing things, as Freemasons often do. Um, Christopher Wren, the most famous architect of England, was very high up in Freemasonry. And this ninth Earl of Pembroke designed various buildings which show his love of Freemasonic symbolism, including the sort of three times three, which is such an important part of it, the quaternary, which is concealed within the ternary, uh, the pyramid form, uh, the two pillars of Yakin and Boaz, etc., etc., etc. So he was a great friend of another Freemason architect, designer, patron, Lord Burlington. He was a great friend of William Kent, uh, the designer, also a Freemason. Of course, it was Kent and Burlington who designed the famous monument to William Shakespeare in Westminster Abbey. Now, I know I keep leaning on the idea that many who are watching this have seen others of my presentations, and I'm always torn between this difficulty of repeating material uh, and therefore boring those who know what I'm saying, or not repeating it and therefore confusing those who are coming new. But to those who are coming new, I can only say that this monument, as with the monument to Shakespeare in Stratford-upon-Avon, have all been decoded in their meaning, laid bare in a series of videos I've put out. And the key to all of these descriptions has been the same every single time. Three, three, three. And the hidden fourth, the quaternary that is concealed within the ternary. Once you know that, you have the key to almost everything. The key that is uh, symbolised, if you like, in the triple tau, three, three, uh, three, which has the quaternary, that fourth T that is sitting undetected in the centre. And all of this symbolises the divinity of man. If you want to understand this a bit better and you haven't got into it yet, I do recommend a video I've put online called The Divinity of Man. And in the first part of that, I go through uh, a lot of this in the simplest way I know how to do it. You should come out of that one video understanding precisely what I'm talking about, what is meant by the fourth T, and how it is that Edward de Vere aligns himself to the Trinity by using 1740, and of course it's pun 1740 as laid out there. It was John Dee who said to him, concentrate on your name, turn it into number, and align it to the Trinity. And this is precisely what Edward de Vere did, knowing that the Trinity contains a fourth part, that quaternary that is hidden. So with four T, with the numeral four and the letter T, uh, you have four Ts, which is 76, which is the same as the gematric value of Oxford. So you have 17 Oxford, and with three Ts, you have 1740, and T, as I said, is 19, times 3, 57, 1740 is 57. So in both of those puns, you have the uh, quaternary that is concealed within the ternary. Now, I'm totally aware that I rather gabbled my way through that. That's because many, many viewers will understand that already. If you don't, go to that video called The Divinity of Man. 
Another key that unlocked this was the Cairo symbol with I-H-S. The Cairo is the initials of Christ in Greek and the I-H-S, the initials of Jesus in Greek. So in this monument, erected in 1740, you see him standing, at least you would see him standing if you could look at him from behind, in the shape of the Cairo symbol. But what I want to look at today is a copy of the monument that was made three years later by the ninth Earl of Pembroke and stands to this day in the hall at Wilton House. It wasn't always in the hall. At one point there was a porch attached to the house, supposedly designed by Holbein. The porch was removed and put into the garden and that statue of Shakespeare was in it. In fact, it was even known as the Shakespeare House, which shows how important Shakespeare was to the Earls of Pembroke. When you see its position, I've got a, a Google aerial shot here, you can see the main house on the right there and that long pathway which goes straight down to the Shakespeare house so looking out as it were almost from the front door you see a direct view to the Shakespeare house which housed that statue in it well since then it has been moved back into the house and it's one of the first things that greets you as a visitor when you walk in the front door now I don't want to go over the shape of it the Cairo shape and all these different facts, because I've dealt with all that when looking at the Westminster Abbey version. This, as I say, was a copy. It was carved by the same man as did Westminster Abbey, Peter Shaymakers, and it cost Lord Pembroke, the ninth Earl of Pembroke, a hundred pounds at the time. The significant difference between this and the original that was made three years earlier is what is written on the scroll, and that's what I want to look at very carefully today and you'll find it is a fascinating encryption. So what do we see on face value? We see a quotation from Macbeth. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. And written at the bottom, Shakespeare's Macbeth in abbreviated form. Shaq's Macb with a th above it. That TH, actually, I'm really sorry because I couldn't get a clearer photograph of it. Uh, if you look closely at it, as I have done, you will see that that TH um, is in the form of a kind of triple tau. So straight away, we're aware that the, uh, the Freemasonic Earl uh, had ordered something to suit his Freemasonic temperament. So what have we got here? On face value, we've got this quotation from Macbeth. It's quite interesting because it's about shadow a player. You can see that he seems to be pointing to the words shadow player, which is odd, at least odd to those who think that William Shakespeare of Stratford wrote all these plays. But those who know that, in fact, William Shakespeare is a pseudonym, then we say, oh, well, I understand why he's pointing to shadow player. But there are some other odd things about this inscription that meet the eye almost immediately. Well, two things I would say that are odd about it. The first one of those is the way some of the lines seem to have been ranged to the left of the page and some seem to have been ranged to the right of the page. And the other oddity I think about it is that some words have been picked out to be written in capitals. We notice, for instance, on the right hand side three words shadow player and stage which are ranged to the right of the page and one on the left hand side which is life so straight away you get this idea of the three plus one the quaternary that is concealed within the ternary this is this mystical idea that is emblematically captured in the triple tau with its three plus one T's, and which, as I said, is used by Edward de Vere in his alignment to the Trinity with 1740. So it'll come as no surprise to you that in the three capitalized words that are ranged to the right, we have 17 letters, and to the left, life, which is four words, which is set deliberately right above a capital T. So we have 1740 in that three plus one arrangement straight away. Makes one wonder if there isn't an acrostic 
going down the left hand side that's the initials the first letters of each line well we do have an acrostic anagram uh, spelling out last and that certainly made me wonder whether if there's an acrostic anagram on the first letter of each line might there not be an acrostic anagram on the last letter of each line notice how our is set back as if to keep it out out of the fray and if we look at the first letter the double v and we treat simply the the, the second letter the v we do indeed have an acrostic anagram v r e e which is of course an acrostic anagram of via there is i can assure you a lot more to it than this and how do we get to that extra bit well i keep going on about the importance of looking where people are pointing this finger is pointing very decidedly at the middle of the word shadow and that word shadow as we have seen is put in capitals and those capitals are placed uh, very squarely above the word player as if to align the two together shadow player let us then have a closer look at shadow player given the obsession with threes and three times three i'm going to start just by looking at the last three letters of shadow player and see how they work out if we take it first in columns three columns we'll start at the end we have at the end column R, which as we know is the 17th uh, letter of the Roman alphabet, so it's 17 in Latin Gematria, and above that, there, well, there's no W in Latin, so we can't have a W in Latin Gematria, but two Vs. In fact, it's written deliberately as a double V, and a V is 20, so two Vs are 40. So we have 1740, surprise, surprise, at the end there. In the next column along, we have the letters E-O, which we all know are the initials of Edward Ox Ford. In fact, you can stare with great interest at these four letters alone. And if you take that double V to represent either a double V, or you can see that there's an X in the middle of it, which could be a chi, which could be also, uh, there's a lambda, which is a Greek L. Well, you can form all sorts of things out of that, including a 17 Earl Ox. Uh, Cairo etc etc but I'm going to come back to those those four letters as they sit there in a moment let's keep going down the columns here the third column along has a Y in the bottom of it a Y obviously uh, symbolizing three as you can see how it's written but a Y was also in old English writing a thorn that is a TH and what happens when you put a T upon an H well, we come back to our old friend, the triple tau, which has the concealed fourth part in it. But there's no concealed fourth part, obviously, in a Y. So we need to bring in a concealed fourth. And what is better as a concealed fourth than the letter D? It represents four in Latin gematria. It is the fourth letter of the alphabet A, B, C, D. And of course, it is also the fourth letter of the word shadow, where you have one S, two H, three A, and four D. Now, if instead of looking down the columns, we look at the rows, in the top row there, we have a four D, and then an O in the middle there, and you can see in the middle of the double V, the X, so we have Oxford. Isn't that brilliant? Because once again, we're using the three plus one, the quaternary that is concealed within the ternary, just three letters, D-O-X, and concealed within that, we have Oxford with that fourth part. The same pertains actually just beneath the second row. There you can see quite easily, if you concentrate on that Y, you can see a V, so we have V E R and that is a ternary. Where is the quaternary that makes it up? Well, just below the R, directly beneath you see your second E. So again, you have both Oxford and Veer that are written as this three plus one, this quaternary concealed within the ternary. Plenty more to it than that, as you may well have guessed. If you take the F out of the E there, we have of our age written straight down there with below it O-R-E. Well, could that be uh, 17th Earl of Oxford since R is 17? Let's hold on to that idea and for the time being expand our view so that we can see the whole of shadow 
player as those two words are aligned and being pointed to by Shakespeare. And let's carry on down the lines with the columns. You'll see a double A. This is something that many of you will be aware is connected both to Shakespeare and to the Earl of Oxford. You see it in the famous double A headpiece, which you find on many Shakespeare quartos, and the portrait of the Earl of Oxford by Nicholas Hilliard. Some splendid work has been done on this portrait by scholars such as Gary Goldstein and John Anthony, and they have shown us that there's no doubt now at all that this portrait is of Oxford. The double A stands in some ways for uh, 1111. Now, this is John Anthony's territory, and I don't really want to encroach upon it, but I recommend his YouTube videos. He talks a lot about this double 11, which I think he's identifying now as the group to which uh, Edward de Vere, Francis Bacon, the, the, belonged to. It's a proto-Masonic group. I've now highlighted the next column, and you can see quite easily there's an L. Well, that is 11 in Roman, Latin Roman gematria, and you can see how the uh, H just above it has a 1-1, one, one, so you've got double 11 there. There's double 11 actually uh, all over this. If you take life's shadow as 11 letters and player stage as 11 letters, the whole of this message is, is 22 words discounting an ampersand. But I, as I say, this I leave uh, to my superior in this field, John Anthony, do visit his website about double 11. What I'd like to concentrate on actually is the four letters here taken together. You have L, H, S and P. If you uh, add up the gematric values of the three uh, letters, L, H, S, they come to 37. 37 plus 3 is 40 and the P treated as a row is 17. So you've got your 1740 there. But I'm actually almost more interested in just taking the I out of that L, since we're taking these letters to pieces a bit, and then you have IHS, IHS with the P, which, as I said, is, the, is a row. And if you look from the bottom left corner of Shadow Player to the top right, we have that uh, double V again, which has the chi in the middle of it. So we have our, our chi row, and in the second four, as I said uh, before, you've got this idea of 17 EO with the remaining letters and double V, 17th Earl of Oxford and a God balancing out the first four and the last four. In the middle he points to a third group of four letters. Remember all things come in threes to this way of thinking and that third group spells out a day written just above his hour. I'm sure that a day his hour acts as an allusion to the second epistle of Peter. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Remember that this whole speech is about man's relation to eternity, man's relation, therefore, to God. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Well, within this short and remarkable gobbit, just by capitalization and the manner in which the lines have been ranged either to the right or to the left, we get the message that Shakespeare, as we know him today, Shakespeare is but a shadow player, but the shadow player of our age, who is Oxford Vere, 1740, and very much connected to the Cairo, which in biblical gematria itself represents 1740, delineated by IHS in hoc signo, in this sign, the initials of Jesus. Now, there is more to it. There always is. So I'll just briefly cover that. And then I want to end with something that utterly puzzles me. And I hope that you, the viewer, will be able to have some suggestions about how to solve it. But first, a simple point. You will remember that a couple of weeks ago, I put up something online showing that on these two title pages. We have a hidden symbol of Christ. Both times they are registering 1740 
and delineating God as a capital G and telling us that Shakespeare was de Vere and God. On the left we have the sonnets and there you can see the Cairo symbol pointing to the capital G to God and de Vere, i.e. de Vere by the grace of God within him. And then if you look to the right, we have the first folio of Shakespeare's plays from 1623. We have 17 letters within a cross with a double V at the top of it. So that's your 1740. And inside the cross, it is saying W Shakespeare's E-O-G is Edward Oxford and God. Well, we do have the same thing on the Wilton Monument. If you draw a cross right there, you see O-E-G or E-O-G. Uh, that's Edward Oxford and God. And then on the patibulum, that's the bit of the cross that goes from side to side, we have the R, which is 17, and the Y, which, as I said, is a TH, which is a triple tau, which has within it four Ts. So you've got your 17, 40, E, O, G, with inside the cross. Exactly the same thing. Now, to the matter that I'm very perplexed about, I feel that having decrypted this monument and the monument at Stratford-upon-Avon, which is on another presentation, and the monument at Westminster Abbey, that I have shown you one masterpiece, that although there were more than a hundred years between the creation of these things, they are clearly created by the same protomasonic group using the same symbols, the same keys and were designed as one and the same. If I look at a map of England and I connect where these extreme monuments are, well the one is in Westminster Abbey, the other at Stratford-upon-Avon and the other at Wilton, we notice something pretty rum, that they are separated as though they were the points of an equilateral triangle. And well, maybe that's just a coincidence, but we happen to know how much in Freemasonry the equilateral triangle matters, how sacred it is. And so it really raises the question, how did this happen? Was it simply divine or were two points on this equilateral triangle already established and a proto-Masonic mind decided to locate the third point where it would make an equilateral triangle. This is what I would like to throw to you for your ideas, because frankly, I am utterly uh, bamboozled by it. What we are seeing here is, I believe, a great edifice designed upon the principle of threes, tria sunt omnia, threes are all, omne trinum perfectum est, everything in threes is perfect but more than that, because it is built upon this mysterious symbol of man's relation to God, the three plus one, the quaternary, that is concealed within the ternary. For not only do we have the three monuments that are all unlocked using this triple tau key, but of course we have the sonnet's dedication, which is unlocked using exactly the same key. So we have three monuments plus a document, and that document just so happens to be laid out as three triangles, which in itself has a fourth triangle hidden within it, but yet as three triangles may well be seen as the three and the other three being the hidden fourth. I don't know which way to look at it. We're looking at triangles within triangles within triangles, all of them unifying in some magical way to a sense of the of the monad of God, who is one and is all. Well, I hope that you have enjoyed this video and were not too confused by it, and that should anyone in future insist to you that three times three is nine, you will respond as Costard did to Baron in Love's Labour's Lost. Not so, sir. We know what we know. Please subscribe to this channel and share with your friends. Thank you very much indeed for watching it.